some coming from the law faculty. Um, before I start, I just want to also commend Juliet and the team mm. for charting this path for us. Um, we really appreciate the work that she's doing. The other aspect is to say that, as Sally mentioned, we're also one of the um, DLL, Division of Lifelong Learning, flexible provision research sites. Um, so I won't go into that because you've heard about that um, from Sally. And my presentation dovetails very nicely with um, Mr. Patel's presentation. In fact, I think I need to come and speak to him afterwards. Uh, just to give you some context also, I really appreciate those who went into a specific component of what they've been using. Um, like Mr. Patel, I'm going to give more of a bird's eye view. Uh, I think there's one advantage, I don't know if there's more, to being head of department, you can make a decree. <laughs> and you can decree that everybody yeah. must put their sight on the comfort. Yeah. And that's a, a good advantage. Um, but our department is a small department. And so, in a sense, we are a victim of our own success. Really, like many departments in the university, we are a department under strain. And the reason for that strain is the growth that has occurred. So that's growth at post, both a undergraduate level as well as postgraduate level. We also sit with these large classes that you've spoken about. In a sense, our first year class is a service course to some other departments, um, and so that strains our capacity. And then our full undergraduate program is also offered after hours. That also places a strain on the department. And so we've had this growth, but at the same time, we are committed to student-centered uh, student learning, and we continuously want to improve our teaching practice. So given that, we have always, since I arrived at the department, there's been this blended learning approach. Um, and so the blended learning approach, as you've heard, is essentially to complement the traditional approaches. So face-to-face -face lectures and the tutorial program will always for us be a critical component um, of our program. But we found always that there's a need to supplement. And so we also used e-teaching and uh, e-learning and then from e-learning to e-teaching and now um, e-comfa. And so typically lecturers would upload the PowerPoint presentations, course resources would be uploaded. Um, and then announcements would be made via the site, which is very beneficial, but it's still very limited because it's a one-way process. So I upload, you download. Now, if you go on to, if you go on to the Mail and Guardian website, you don't want to download. You want to surf, right? You want to browse, okay? And that is the distinction. It's a very subtle distinction. But that is the distinction in the move from e-teaching to e-comfa. Because you are now able to create an interactive um, environment. And you've seen some of that in the previous presentations. So it's really not about only access. It's also about engagement. Um, because access doesn't necessarily mean engagement. So we took a decision to be one of the pilot sites that had moved to e-comfa. And um, ICAMFA was introduced at all levels, so first year, second year, third year. Our staff went for training, tutors went for training, and also students received training in the first term of this year. I must say that implementation has been uneven, and a lot of that has to do with capacity. Um, so while there was a very big advancement, in that, as you've seen, you can structure your course, so you've got your weeks, um, and if there is, let's say, a clip which is used in class, 
which is part of a discussion. Maybe you weren't there. It gets loaded up to the site and you can immediately go and see. And so that is very, very powerful. Um, and as I said, it was really a leap forward. The problem um, for me is that, so for example, the tutorial program, as you've just heard, is really critical. And so one of my very noble goals was to replicate the tutorial program, the physical tutorial program, to replicate it online. And it is actually just due to capacity constraints that we didn't get there. So the kind of things that you're talking about is really, really critical because to me, a lot of where learning happens is in the tutorial program. And so some of the stuff that's been mentioned about time, so how do you limit, if you are now engaged in this online environment, how do you limit time? One of the goals that I had was to say, for each tutor, there should be an amount of time which they're available online. And that can be staggered. So in your case, if you've got your 12 tutors, they must post their online consultation times. Um, and so students would then be able to have access in that way. And that assists the lecturer because then the load is spread um, across tutors as well as across um, the lecturer as well. Okay, so as I say, it's a very powerful platform. It moves beyond the I upload, you download. Um, but really it depends on the capacity. Um, you've got to allocate resources and you've got to allocate time for the implementation process. And so, you know, my involvement with the Division of Lifelong Learning, the director, Shelley Walter, said to me, what image can you put um, when you, you think of your department? And I said, well, because we're small and because we continuously moving, it feels a bit like trying to change the wheel of the car while you're driving. <laughs> and this is part of the lesson that we can distill for people wanting to move to your campus. Allocate the time that you need. Because in, in political studies, in politics, things happen. So you want them to upload as you go. But that shouldn't be your primary modus operandi. It should be gather your material before the time. Think through your course before the time so that you're not trying to change the wheel as you're driving. So what I'll do is just then distill some key lessons from our experience. And the one that I've just mentioned with that image is allocating sufficient time um, for the course design so, so that you don't feel like you're changing the wheel while you're driving. Um, it's, it's really important to not develop the site as you go. Because then otherwise you'll feel like you just can't put the wheel on. The other aspect is that training is really important. And as we've heard during the course of the day, different people have different appetites for innovation. And this is a general um, aspect. So it would be your lecturers have different appetites for innovation, your tutors have different appetites, your students have different appetites. So the training is very, very important. Then as I mentioned, it's also critically important to think through your course content, including your quality control mechanisms well in advance of designing the course. Um, and this is especially important um, in terms of assessments. So Juliet and her team is great, right? But she will be able to advise you. You can't come to her and say, Eek, which tool should I use? You really need to have thought through what needs to be done before and your content, your assessment, all of those things. Um, and then jointly with the team, you can decide what tools would most appropriately engage students. So also gathering as much as material as you can beforehand as I say in political studies, there's lots of exciting things that happen as you go, and it's good to keep the course relevant so you add as you go, but to have most of your material beforehand. And then what I found really useful was to add our subject librarian. So everybody's been saying how wonderful it is that the students get the announcements immediately. If you add your subject librarian, fantastic, because she then also 
gets the announcements immediately. She sees what resources you are uploading, or he, sorry. Um, and then by the time the student comes and asks for assistance, he or she knows exactly what the student is talking about. So I found that to be really, really important. And then the point is that your course will be as alive or as dead as you make it. So as I mentioned to you, we implemented it across all levels. Um, and some really worked very, very well. I've got one course where it's been a bit dead, to be honest with you. And that is because I haven't had the time to make it as alive as some of my other courses have been. Um, so it really is very important to put the time in up front. Um, and all these lessons would apply for our department again because we're moving from term-based courses to semester-based courses. So we've got to do all the thinking and the designing um, for 2014. The other aspect that I needed to mention, we've heard about the negative impression regarding perhaps experiences or previous systems. Um, it's really important to do damage control if something happens. So if there's an instance where there isn't access, um, that should be damage control. Otherwise, the user or the tutor has a, a negative experience embedded in them and they then don't want to go forward. It's also useful to think about having a dedicated person to drive the process. Um, it's well and good to say to decree and say everybody needs to move to the new platform. It's really important to have somebody who keeps a keeps their eye on what's going on um, in the different courses. Um, and then finally to say it's really not as daunting as it seems. We've heard this from various speakers. So just again to commend Juliet and to say uh, embrace the change. It's really powerful. Thank you. that we have reinforced the importance of us as lecturers to think when we design these courses. So we have to thoroughly think about this when we get onto the online spaces. But the other thing that I've, I'm taking home with is the issue of having the subject librarian <coughs> to be part of it. Because that, for me, is wonderful. It works really well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. She has covered a bit of what I wanted to say regarding the, 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 the changing of the wheel yes. while running. For me, it seems like that's what happens most of the time. Well, there's so much to be implemented um, from year to year, even though one would know what needs to be done in the particular year. But that particular year you're running, there are things that need to be fulfilled. So for me, it felt like it's a usual thing. It's, I thought it's a normal stuff. That's how it happens. So maybe you, I can talk to you later to say, how can you actually stop it, put on hold, change the wheel, and then get driving again? Because I don't see how can that happen. It's always on the move yes. with the academia, with everything that is required, and we change the wheels as we go, and sometimes it doesn't work that much. So if you've got your course outline sorted at that point, then when you go to Juliet and say, this is what I'm planning, this is what I think is the most appropriate tool, um, that is preempting changing the whole wheel while you're driving. If you come shortly, students are about to arrive and now you're just sending off your outline to the printer and getting the course, then you're setting yourself up to change the wheel while you're driving. So I don't think we can ever fully get away um, from that. Um, but there's, there's things that one can do. I'm really not sure. Maybe we can make them watch the, the streaming. <laughs> yes, um, I, I heard you talk about uh, having someone to drive the process. Yeah. Um, in most faculties, we have a teaching and learning specialists. Yeah. 
Do you think it makes sense to have even if it's a part-time person or a a tutor or one of the, the postgraduate students in each department mm -hmm. driving the process for everybody? Do you think it makes sense? Look, I think the problem is the with resource constraint. So I think identify the person that's got the most appetite for innovation, mm -hmm. and I think they're leaning towards it anyway. Mm -hmm. And then say, look, wouldn't you like to take up the baton? Um, this is what can be done. Wouldn't you like to take up the baton in coordinating it? So I think given the challenges that we face in terms of resources, probably to identify a person in the department, um, I'm not sure about at faculty level, but I would say in the department. I just want, oh, yes. no, I just wanted to attempt to response to the question that the gentleman has asked. In some faculties, chaplains have been identified and it works very well. Mm -hmm. For example, the first presenter, Mr. Ronald Adamson, for example, is our champion in EMS. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it does help if you have the younger, the younger <laughs> generation, you know. <laughs> Um, driving the process. Mm. And so I think in your faculty you could try that out and see how it pans out. And the other aspect is actually to bring the teaching and learning team, the reps, on board. Uh, because by nature the teaching and learning specialist or the deputy dean of teaching and learning would be positively predisposed to this. So at the teaching and learning meeting to say, look, there are these advances which enhance the teaching and learning process take it back to your departments and let's try and get the conversation going that way. The, the, the good news is that the only staff member in political studies who refused to learn digital learning reached a compulsory time in 2008. <laughs> 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 so since then it's been less stuff for subsequent heads of department. A big thank you to Cheryl yeah. for Keeping us as a pioneer, and a huge thank you to Caroline, Tassie, and Juliet, and all the others who've been so supportive right since in 1996 we made political studies the first department outside the science faculty where work processing all coursework was compulsory. Are you? 